Welcome, everyone. All right, we got the slideshow up. We got the microphone unmuted. We're ready to go. We are going to talk about today super fun National Labor Relations Act stuff. Uh, never before in the history of the world have super fun and National Labor Relations Act uh, ever been used together. Um, so buckle up. It's going to be an enjoyable one, I think, and informational. So today, just real briefly, we're going to talk about where we're going uh, so that we all know what we're going to talk about. Uh, I'm not going to bury the lead today. We're going to start, <clears throat> excuse me, start off talking about the joint employer rule. Uh, we're going to get a little bit into the National Labor Relations Act in general. We're going to talk about a slew of recent National Labor Relations Board rulings. Some people have called it the hot labor summer. Um, unfortunately, it's been going on since February. Um, so um, I guess unless we're in Australia where it's summer in February, it has been lasting uh, a seriously long time, uh, this National Labor Relations Board changes. Um, and finally, we're going to talk about what you can do to get in line and get in compliance and make sure that everything is up to snuff with your company and your policies and your procedures so that you don't fall victim to the recent changes uh, coming from the Federal National Labor Relations Board. All right, jumping into it, the new joint employer rule. Uh, this rule came down on October 26, 2023. And it was published uh, on that date, meaning it takes effect 60 days from that date, um, absent either congressional review, which is where Congress can get together and, and pass a, 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 an act basically saying that we don't like the rule that this agency made uh, and we're gonna overrule it. Or if someone were to file a legal action and obtain a court injunction delaying or staying implementation of this rule. Uh, so for those of you that were doing HR back in the Obama administration, you might remember their attempt to change the salary threshold for the overtime rule. Um, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce filed suit in the Fifth Circuit down, down in Texas um, to delay or stop implementation of that new overtime rule, and they were successful uh right before that thing was about to come into effect so a lot of companies have done a lot of work to get it done um, and it's also not out of the realm of possibility that someone might try to do that here i haven't heard anything of uh, a lawsuit yet um i'll admit i have not been trolling pacer to look at uh, local court filings or district court filings but um it doesn't mean it hasn't happened but if it does uh, my hr council subscribers will let you know what's happening when it's happening um if it does happen i also do know that there was talk of uh, uh senator manchin from west virginia and another uh a republican senator uh starting the process for the con congressional review um all i've heard is that it's been talked about i haven't heard anything further from that but again we'll keep you abreast on that as things transpire all right back to the rule itself this new rule drastically expands the scope of joint employment rule under the National Labor Relations Act. And it overrides and rescinds uh, <clears throat> a rule that was published in 2020. So under this new rule, a business is a joint employer with another business if it has the right to exercise control over any of seven enumerated terms or conditions of employment even if it never exercises such control, and even if the only way it could exercise such control would be through an intermediary. Now this slide, I'm just gonna show you the seven conditions uh, or terms of employment. We're not gonna dive deep into them. You'll get the slides, so you'll have it into them, but this is verbatim from the board. Um, and if you look at them generally, a lot of these are pretty common things. You know, what duties are going to be done? When are you going to do them? Who's going to supervise them? Uh, what are your working conditions? Who is responsible for safety and health? So a lot of these things, they're not exotic. They're stuff that you're going to have uh, control over for either your independent contractors, your employees, or if somebody else has an employee on your premises, 
a lot of that's going to be hashed out and it's going to be covered um uh, it's going to be covered by your contract or your your agreement with the other company and what happens is that ropes you into being a joint employer with that other company so you might be saying nielsen why do i care i'll tell you why you care um first as we'll learn the national labor relations act applies to pretty much every private sector employer there, there's very few exceptions uh, we'll get into it in a little bit, but the NLRA is quite expansive in its reach. And also expansive is this new view of joint employment. It's essentially going to threaten the viability of a range of relationships out there that were not intended to create joint employment situations. You know, for, for example, those between a business and its service providers. So if you're a company and you hire a staffing agency for staffing, uh, to fill in vacancies, or maybe you just use mass staffing as a as a labor component. Uh, it could also be an issue between a franchisor and a franchisee. So if you're a franchisee, and uh, everyone's understanding is that your employees of the franchise, um, independent franchise, are only your employees, and they are not employees of corporate headquarters, the franchisor, um, that's going to upend this and turn it on its ear. Um, so essentially what we're talking about is employers who contract with third parties for services are going to have to carefully consider whether they're going to continue to do so, how they're going to, and how they're going to do so, because the risk of a joint employment finding has increased significantly. So basically in short, this new rule it broadens the universe of potential joint employers subject to National Labor Relations Act requirements. The good news uh, is, if there is any, is that this rule only affects joint employment as defined under the National Labor Relations Act. It does not affect determinations of joint employment under federal wage and hour law, such as the Fair Labor Standards Act, overtime, minimum wage stuff, uh, or any state laws. So under the National Labor Relations Act and under this rule, uh, joint employers are going to be subject to all the requirements of the National Labor Relations Act, such as having a duty to bargain. Um, and through this new rule, joint employers can be held for accountable for unfair labor practices involving workers they did not think that were even their own employees. So just an example, if you're a franchisee, Let's say you're a burger joint and you franchise and your workers want to unionize a la Starbucks and um, they send you to petition and they go through the start the election process. What this means is that the franchisor as a joint employer would also be required to come to the bargaining table. That causes a lot of issues, um, a lot of issues in terms of compliance, who is in charge who's gonna to get to negotiate, who has power. None of these things were ever negotiated in your franchise agreement because they weren't even contemplated because nobody thought they would be an issue. Uh, another reason why you should care, uh, also a franchise specific one, but I stole this clause here um, from, uh, I think it was from the SEC's website, Edgar. This is either, um, this is either a, uh, Burger King or a KFC franchise, I can't remember. But this is part of an indemnification agreement. Uh, this indemnif indemnification clause here, buried on 20, page 29 of the franchise agreement, uh, basically lays out all the things that the franchisee has to do to indemnify the franchisor in case of any lawsuits or claims made against them. And particularly, I'm going to highlight down here in section six, you know, any claim or demand brought by an employee uh, or a subcontractor of the franchisee is going to be something that is required to be indemnified uh, by the franchisee. And what do I mean by indemnify? It means that you, as the franchisee here, get the privilege of paying to defend the franchisor against this claim, against any damages from the claim, uh, depending on the clause, I'll be honest, I didn't read this whole thing because it was super long and I didn't need to. 
but a lot of times these indemnification clauses allow the person who is being indemnified here would be the franchisor to choose what attorneys actually handle the matter. So that means if you have a relationship with a specific attorney who handles all your matters, knows how you do stuff, um, the franchisor can come in and say, ah, no, you're going to use this really expensive law firm that we like better. And so you might go from paying, you know, $350 an hour for an attorney to, you know, $700,000 an hour for an attorney because the franchisor gets to pick. So another example, I'm going to still, I stole this one actually from a staffing agency agreement I reviewed last week. Uh, this one basically says that the, the vendor here, the staffing agency, has to indemnify the client uh, here for failure to comply with applicable laws and regulations. Guess what one of those applicable laws and regulations is? The National Labor Relations Act. So if you as a staffing agency place some employees at uh, a client site and those temps are doing work and those temps choose to unionize, those temps complain about worksite conditions and you blow them off and they file a complaint with the National Labor Relations Board, not only do you have to defend that claim against yourself, but you have to defend your client against that claim because they are now a joint employer under the new National Labor Relations Act uh, case or rule. And you only not only have to pay for yourself and your attorneys, you have to pay for their attorneys, you have to pay for any damages. Um, as I said earlier, your client might have the right to choose what attorneys actually defend the case. Uh, all in all, it's kind of a mess. So that's what the rule is and why you should care. We're going to back up a few steps right now. We're just going to talk generally, for those of you who don't know, about the National Labor Relations Act and what it is. Uh, so for, for those of you who've ever attended one of my webinars in the past about the NLRA or the Fair Labor Standards Act, uh, I get a little dark. Um, and I only get that way because I just like to set the stage in terms of how these laws actually came to be. So as you can see, the NLRA was passed in 1935. It was one of the cornerstones of FDR's New Deal. Um, and similar to the Fair Labor Standards Act, uh, this law was born out of actual bloodshed and death. So around the turn of the century and right before, there were lots of strikes, either at individual companies or at entire industries or citywide general strikes that were happening across the United States. Now, complaints about working conditions probably go back to the beginning of time. But in America, towards the end of the 1800s and into the 1900s, things picked up in terms of worker complaints. And as the 1900s rolled on, they kept you know, steam steamrolling and snowballing. Uh, for example, in Oregon, California, and Washington in 1934, shipping was shut down for two months because all the workers went on strike. That meant no goods came in or went out of the ports on America's west coast at all for two straight months. In striking, uh, striking workers clashed with police, six of them were killed. Uh, in 1934, April of, in Toledo, 10,000 auto workers went on strike. Two of them were killed in strikes by forces opposing the strike. Uh, closer to home, me, I'm in Milwaukee, so we had the Bayview Massacre, where uh, employees of, I believe, it was the Milwaukee Iron Works went on strike. Uh, they were joined by women and children, and later uh, the forces, the, the government forces opposing the strike uh, killed people, including women and innocent women and children. So there is a lot of dark history behind the National Labor Relations Act and why it was passed. Um, what it basically does, though, is the National Labor Relations Act protects employees' rights to unionize, and to engage in other concerted activities for the purpose of collective bargaining or mutual protection. Uh, these are sometimes called Section 7 rights or protected concerted activity, and they allow employees to discuss wages and safety concerns in the workplace. 
it would be a violation of the National Labor Relations Act to have a policy or to take action that would interfere with or chill an employee's rights uh, under the National Labor Relations Act. So just as a bit of background, the National Labor Relations Act applies to all, employ all employers in the U.S. but for railways, airlines, agricultural and domestic workers, and public sector employees. And public sector, again, are uh, employees of state, federal, and local governments or their respective subdivisions. So as you can see, this amounts to the vast majority of private sector employers in this country. When you say, well, Nielsen, I'm not a union shop. I don't have any unions. None of my guys are unionized. Nobody's organized. Um, I, I don't see how this how this affects me. The short answer is union or no, the National Labor Relations Act still applies to you. The National Labor Relations Act, remember I talked about all the bad stuff that was happening before it was passed. It presumes that there's an inherent inequality between employers and employees basically says that employers have more leverage when it comes to uh, enacting policies and being able to stand up for their own rights and that employees have less leverage when it comes to that sort of stuff. And I said organize into trade unions um, or organize for collective good. You know, it doesn't mean that the AFL-CIO is going to walk on your on your property or, or, or the ghost of Jimmy Hoffa is going to show up and start handing out pamphlets to your members and start engaging in collective bargaining. It, it goes beyond that because remember I said it talks about being able to complain about workplace uh, conditions. It could be safety issues. It could be wages. So the NLRA will still apply to you uh, even though you don't have, a, even though you're not a union shop. And there's a whole bunch of cases, uh, they're actually really fun cases uh, to read um, if you're super into the law like I am about how the Labor uh, National Labor Relations Act applies to non-union shops. Um, but in the interest of time, we're going to skip over those um, for today. So the National Labor Relations Board has been really busy uh, like I said, somebody, I went to a webinar and they were calling it hot labor summer. Um, and I, it's funny, it's got a good ring to it, but it's been going on since February. And we're going to talk about the things that have been happening um, throughout uh, this past year. You know, so first we talked about the, how they expanded the joint employer rules and we talked about who's covered by the National Labor Relations Act and why you were likely covered. Now we're going to get into some of the details about the changes that have come down for the National Labor Relations Board this year to expand exposure under the act that most of you probably didn't even pay any attention to. Uh, so the first case we're going to talk about is McLaren McComb, uh, or Makeham maybe, probably Makeham. Uh, that is my understanding is a hospital in Georgia and in this case, the National Labor Relations Board held that a separation agreement that prohibited employees from making disparaging remarks about their employer uh, and also prohibited them from disclosing the terms of the agreement to others, and that even that such an agreement was even offered to them, violates the National Labor Relations Act. This case is from February of uh, this year, February 21st, I believe, 2023. So, the issue here is if you use a separation agreement that is in violation of the National Labor Relations Act, you have just won yourself the honor of having an unfair labor practice filed against you and your joint employer. And recall the indemnification issues I pointed out earlier. Um, so not only do you have to defend this, but you probably have to defend your joint employer too, depending on how your contract reads. So what do you do? Well, ASK subscribers, uh, subscribers to my HR counsel, are going to have access to attorney drafted separation agreements that ensure that you are always using the most up to date documents. I remember right after this case came down, we updated all our separation agreements uh, to make sure that they were all up to snuff and that we didn't have any offending language in there. 
The next thing that happened was the general council memo 23-08. So on May 30th, uh, looks like the NLRB took two months off. Uh, the NLRB, the general counsel, her name is Jennifer Abruzzo, she issued this uh, general counsel memo setting forth her opinion that most non-compete provisions violate the rights afforded to employees under Section 7 of the National Labor Relations Act. The memo provided that any non-compete provision which reasonably tends to chill an employee's right to engage in Section 7 activity violates the act unless the employer can show that it is narrowly tailored to address a special circumstance that justifies the agreement. So what that basically, that last clause means is that you have to do a lot of fancy drafting in order for it to pass muster. The memo also coincidentally falls in step with a lot of state laws that are outright banning non-competes in recent years. The most recent of which being Minnesota's uh, ban, effective uh, July 1st of this year, and com comports with the Federal Trade Commission's uh, controversial proposition to ban the use of non-competes in employment agreements nationwide at the federal level. We can discuss the merits of that some other time, probably deserves its own podcast should it ever get uh, more fully fleshed out and proposed. Um, and again, my HR Council uh, subscribers will pass along those details if, as things, if they start to solidify on that, we'll let you know what's going on and you'll be the first to know after we do. But back to this General Council memo. Uh, this memo here, um, for the General Council, non-competes chill an employee's Section 7 rights because one, Employees are aware they will have difficulty obtaining another job if they get terminated for complaining about working conditions uh, because the non-compete will stop them. Number two, given those employees an ability to replace that lost income, their bargaining power is diminished in lockout strikes and other disputes because of the non-compete. And three, the non-compete prohibition render it unlikely that employees will reunite at a new workplace, rendering them unable to leverage their prior relationships to encourage each other to exercise their rights. Uh, you know, it's kind of like uh, the Blues Brothers clause, I guess. They, they're preventing employees from getting the band back together at a different uh, company because of the non-compete. So <clears throat> there's five ways that the general counsel, oh, five ways that the general counsel says that these uh, this protected activity is chilled by non-competes. Number one, it stops employees from threatening to resign to demand better working conditions. Two, it stops employees from actually resigning to secure better work conditions. Three, it stops employees from seeking or accepting employment with local competitors to get better working conditions. Four, it stops uh, co uh, stops employees from soliciting coworkers to a local competitor as a part of a broader uh, protected concerted activity. And finally, it says she says that uh, seeking employment to specifically engage in protected concerted activity with other employees uh, at another another workplace, such as union union organizing, is chilled by these restrict non competes. Uh, so this came down, this memo came down, what did I say, May 30th. Uh, amazingly, the National Labor Relations Board has already filed a test case on this out of Cincinnati. That case, um, if you were, um, actually, if you're paying attention, if you look at my slide here, I say restrictive covenants. That's a legal term of art. That means non-solicits and non-competes. Um, if you were paying attention earlier, I was saying non-competes. Um, the National Labor Relations Board in this test case out of Cincinnati included non-solicitation agreements. So non-solicitation of clients and non-solicitation of employees, also called anti-poaching clauses. So not only did they act to enforce the guidance under this memo, um, but they're acting to expand upon the guidance under this memo. So. If you're a company, uh, for example, that uses a staffing agency for labor, and that staffing agency has a non-solicit or a non-compete with their employees, um, and 
one of their employees files an unfair labor practice complaint against it, you could be roped in to that unfair labor practice complaint in front of the National Labor Relations Board, even though you had nothing to do with those employees. Something to keep in mind. Uh, we talked earlier about protected concerted activity, uh, which again, is the right to engage in, in activities for the purpose of collective bargaining or other mutual aid or protection. Um, it generally required two or more workers acting together to better, better their pay or working conditions. Uh, the activity could happen with or without a union, which made it pretty common in the workplace. However, if you look at these one, two, three, four, five, six cases I, I mentioned here, the board has expanded essentially what the definition of protected concerted activity is. Uh, in the Miller, pra Miller Plastic case, um, there was, uh, you guys remember this thing called the pandemic back in March of 2020, where everything shut down? Uh, well, during that time, uh, the employees at Miller Plastic went to a meeting and one of the employees, just one of them during a group meeting about continuing in-person work said, we shouldn't be working and complained about lack of personal protective equipment, uh, return to work rules and having contact with other employees who had uh, been exposed to COVID. Notice I said one employee brought this up at a meeting. What the board said is that we no longer are going to be required to look to see if this employee is actually acting on behalf of other employees or if this was an authorized group activity. Uh, there are more, it, it basically expands the protections for what is called solo concerted activity. So if you're acting even on yourself uh, as an individual, you can have it can be concerted activity under the act so these actions are going to sound a lot like individual complaints individual beefs individual gripes but the, according in the infinite wisdom of the national labor relations board an employee can act concertedly without a group or union forming in the background with that in mind you have to be mindful of anyone bringing up pay equity concerns uh, people complaining about re remote work or return to office issues. You have to be concerned about people complaining about diversity and hiring or promotion concerns. Uh, you have to be mindful of other complaints that will affect more than just one employee. You know, so if an employee, one employee says there's a, a trip hazard, you know, on the floor, we need to take care of it even though that employee is just acting by himself and not or herself and not on behalf of other employees automatically now becomes protected concerted activity as the definition of protected concerted activity has expanded and now again along with the joint employer rule uh, if you're going to be deemed to be a joint employer with the company whose employee did this you are now also going to be brought into the unfair labor practice complaint. Uh, the American Federation for Children case, uh, here the protected concerted activity was for a former employee to be rehired. So a former employee uh, was terminated because, get this, they were not actually authorized to work in the United States. If you're not actually authorized to work in the United States, you cannot be an employee of a company. If you're not an employee of a company under the National Labor Relations Act, it used to be that you had no protections under the National Labor Relations Act. Guess what happened in this case? The board found that the individual was an employee under the act, even if they weren't authorized to work in the United States. So another case, an example of expansion of the protect what is considered protected concerted activity and what is considered to be something that could have an unfair labor practice complaint filed for it. Third case here, Intertape Polymer. Uh, here, uh, this is a, I'm gonna give a short overview of this one because it's pretty technical in terms of the legalese. But 
this basically loosens the burden on the general counsel uh, in terms of filing an unfair labor practice complaint. Only general animus is required and evidence here can be circumstantial evidence. It doesn't have to be direct evidence. So it used to be that there had to be intent um, and here it doesn't have to be specific intent. Um, they're basically loosening the burden for having an unfair labor practice complaint filed against you. Uh, Atlanta Opera case, another short one I'm going to give you. Uh, this case expanded coverage for what a Section 7 violation included, um, and it included independent contractor misclassification. Um, so independent contractors became uh, uh, part of what is covered by protected concerted activity. Lion Elastomers 2. Uh, this case changed the standards relating to discipline or discharge of workers who cross the line of offensive or abusive conduct while engaging in protected concerted activity. Uh, so in this case, if I remember correctly, an employee uh, basically berated their supervisor and said some vulgar things to their boss. Um, but they did it in, under the guise of uh, advocating for a union, uh, which was considered protected concerted activity. So the board here held that to fully protect employee rights, conducting uh, conduct during protected concerted activity has to be evaluated in the context of that activity, not as if it occurred in an ordinary workplace condition. So if I went up uh, after this after this uh, webinar and called up my boss Mark and I said, "F you, you're a tool," um, yeah, that would probably get me fired. Um, but if I did the same thing and then added, I think you should uh, recognize the union or I think we are all not getting paid enough, well, then that becomes uh, protected concerted activity. And even though what I said probably would be generally a fireable offense, if I did it under the guise of protected concerted activity, that becomes, you, know, you guessed it, protected under the National Labor Relations Act. And if something happens to me because of it, I get to file an unfair labor practice complaint. Uh, final one, Fred Meyer stores. This is, a, this is actually an older one. Um, I snuck it in there because I thought it made sense, though. Uh, this dispute actually began in the summer of 2020, where employees at a Washington uh, Fred Meyer stores started wearing BLM pins and face masks. Um, workers there had previously worn other pins and masks with lgbtq plus and messages and pronouns and insp inspirational messages and sports team insignia you know and, and nobody ever batted an eye but when they started to do blm uh paraphernalia and masks and whatnot uh then fred meyer cracked down on it here in this case the alj ordered that the employer had to rescind and revise their dress code policies that prohibited uh, the display of this protected insignia, as well as to inform the employees that the dress code had changed. This case I threw in because uh, I wanted to show it doesn't have to do, I mean, that is pretty far afield, I think, from protected concerted activity. You know, Black Lives Matters, uh, is more of me a societal issue and not an individual issue in each store. Um, it's not complaining about specific working conditions at the store. That's not saying like, you know, the the trash compactor in back has an unguarded electrical box that sparks and it's unsafe. Um, this is more of a general issue, but the National Labor Relations Board did not ask for my opinion. And so uh, they went with what they thought. So we talked about all these violations and all these expansions of what is uh, a protected concerted activity. And so just real quick, these are the, the remedies for those that are terminated due to an unfair labor practice. You know, they get reinstatement to their job, they get back pay, they get direct and foreseeable economic harm. So, <coughs> excuse me, if they had their car repossessed because they lost their job and they couldn't make their payments because you fired them, um, they could get compensated for that. 
and you also have to change your rules and let your employees know you changed your rules and you have to post notices and send out notices that hey our rules have changed because we were wrong and the national labor relations board wants us to let you know that we were wrong uh two more things in terms of changes um i did a whole webinar on this a couple weeks ago stair cycle this case came down in the beginning of august um basically upended the rules on employee handbooks under the national labor relations act uh, and they're probably going to be at least five main policies in your handbook you're going to want to look at to make sure they're not overly coercive and therefore unlawful and therefore subject to an unfair labor practice complaint. So here, um, the board also kind of expanded on what is uh, what their rules are for proceeding with complaints. So the board now states that if an employee could reasonably interpret a rule to have a course of meeting, the, the NLRB is going to say, yep, it does. So in other words, you're guilty until proven innocent by the NLRB in terms of uh, handbook rules and policies that could infringe on Section 7 rights. So to think about it, uh, that would be anything that might deter an employee from reporting a safety issue in a handbook. In this case, it was they couldn't take out their cell phones and take a picture of the safety issue because cell phones were outright banned. Uh, Two, they couldn't allow uh, anything that would not allow an employee to complain about wages uh, would be something that would rise to a complaint. Uh, any policy that might allow an employee um, uh, to complain about wages is, was under the guise of uh, not taking actions that would make the company look bad. So they were basically saying you can't go with Facebook and say I'm underpaid. Um, because that would be a violation of their, uh, I can't remember what it was, it was their uh, conflict of interest policy, actually, I believe. Um, so all those things are what the National Labor Relations Board is gonna look at in your handbook and in your policies. And it goes back again to the imbalance of power between the employer and the employee. So you wanna make sure that your handbook is up to date um, and that your handbook is compliant. Uh, my HR Council members, uh, those of you that subscribe to us, know that you get a handbook. We have updated our handbooks. Uh, all our handbooks now have the newly compliant language in there to make sure that you don't run afoul of the National Labor Relations Board. And that if somebody, um, if you do have a joint employment relationship with somebody, that uh, they wouldn't be able to file an unfair labor practice complaint and rope you uh, or your partner in to a new case. Uh, finally, in terms of rule changes, uh, this one just came down on Halloween, uh, spooky season, uh, still not over for the National Labor Relations Board. Uh, there is a new memoration, <clears throat> excuse me, memorandum of understanding between the National Labor Relations Board, the U.S. Department of Labor, and OSHA. And what that is, it's created a formal partnership between the agencies and what these agencies are going to do is they're going to collaborate with each other by sharing information, uh, cross-training agency staff, and partnering on investigative efforts within their authority. Specifically, they plan to enforce anti-retaliation provisions to protect workers who raise concerns about workplace violations or retaliation. So essentially what this means is that more info is going to be shared between the departments uh, the DOL investigators are going to be trained to understand what might be an NLRB complaint or an OSHA complaint and act on those and refer them to the other agency as, as uh, possible. So basically, it just, again, is another broadening of potential liability, uh, not only under National Labor Relations Act, but also other federal uh, agency laws as well. So. Uh, we have four minutes left. We talked about all these bad things that are happening with the National Labor Relations Act um, in other areas. So how do you make sure that you um, are not going to trigger some indemnification obligation to defend uh, one of your uh, business partners, be it a franchisor, be it uh, a 
business client, if you're a staffing agency or if you're a you know, um, business client, that you're not going to get involved with somebody else's drama. Um, you know, you got a couple options. You could use Google uh, to find an and a handbook template or an answer to an employment law question. Uh, you could use some sort of employment law service that uses non-attorneys for your handbook or uses non-attorneys to give you uh, non non-backed employment law advice uh, or you could do the ostrich and just you know just keep your head in the sand and all that ends up doing is costing you money down the road um, my advice and I know I'm biased I admit it is that you sign up for my HR counsel we help you uh, avoid these pitfalls we help you avoid these traps if you got questions that pop up during the workday you submit a ticket to us uh, via our email system and we answer your question quickly within two business hours we get back to you and we help you make sure that you don't fall victim to one of these crazy new rules that nobody was paying attention to you can see here uh, all the stuff we do you know, for more information, there's our contact information right there, info at MyHR Council. And with that, I'm going to hand it back over to Dan for some closing remarks. Thanks. Yes, thank you, Andy. That was really great information that you gave the attendees today. Um, a lot to definitely consider. Um, if you have any questions and are already a client of ours, you know that you can go on to our Ask an Attorney portal open a ticket and speak to an attorney like Andy within two hours. If you're a franchise or a business owner and aren't a MyHR Council client yet, but understand the value of having unlimited HR and employment legal advice whenever you need it. Uh, for just starting at $149 per month, please reach out to us at info at um, And once again, thank you so much for attending today. We hope you can join us again in the future for another one of our webinars. Um, stay up to date by following us on social media and our newsletter. Uh, we will continue to update with this latest ruling. Um, we hope you have a great rest of the day. We definitely appreciate you. Thank you.